This is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast, hosted by Roman Prokopchuk, bringing you all things digital marketing, tech, business, and motivation. What's stopping you from becoming relentless in all aspects of life? Are you ready to become a digital savage? Let's get into today's episode. Hey everyone, this is Roman Prokopchuk and this is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast. Today I have with me Jeremy Roadruck. He's a best-selling author, Kung Fu master, Pan American champion, former member of the military, former corporate weight slave, and former factory worker. Jeremy has been through many seasons and adventures in his life. Thanks for joining me today. Hey Roman, thanks for having me here. This is a really great opportunity. I'm very excited. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. So tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you get to the uh, 2019 you? Well, it started, oddly enough, with my birth. And that was already an adventure because it turns out I didn't find out till later. Uh, my mom had eight miscarriages plus my brother and I. So I could have been one of 10, uh, but I ended up being only one of two. And the reason that's important is I actually went through some unpleasantness when I was five and six, uh, ended up being abused, and that drove me into some very negative places as a very young kid. Uh, I was one of those smart kids that like, you know, nobody could reach, none of the adults could influence. And being mad at myself, being mad at the world, not knowing why, because I had repressed the memories, it led to some very, very interesting experiences growing up. I quit smoking when I was nine, for example. And uh, I also decided at nine I wanted to be a dad instead of being a monk because St. Francis of Assisi and I was raised Catholic, so holy orders and all that was kind of in my mind. And so I started my midlife crisis a little young. And then as I matured, I ended up actually getting involved with martial arts in my 20s. And that became a vehicle for me to create strength and resourcefulness and really to reintegrate the parts of myself that I was making wrong and learn to get out of my head and bring my body, my heart, my emotions, kind of bring everybody back into the same household. And it really began to change who I was, where I was. So that instead of being this difficult, hard to manage kid who ran into traffic when he was, when he was four, climbed on the roof of the house, raised on a leash, to being kicked out of the gifted programs for reading and math in middle school, to almost not graduating because I had mono and depression my junior year and I only needed an English credit to graduate, but I didn't want to write stuff on time. Going from that place to now being an international best-selling author, Kung Fu master, Pan American champion, husband and father, really the martial arts was the, the doorway to all of that because it helped to bring the body, the mind, the emotions back together instead of making parts of myself wrong or pushing away different parts of myself. And I can't be like this and I can't be like that. And I can't trust and those sorts of things. So that was the, the bulk of the journey in a nutshell is, is really from a place of, of really great darkness, not knowing why to in my mid twenties, the memories coming back and having the tools and the resources to really unlock all that stuff, learn from it and release it. So it doesn't have to hold me anymore. Nice. Yeah. And uh, with the whole miscarriage thing, me and my wife have experienced five. So, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So it's it's like an emotional toll after each one. And we're also uh, foster parents. So we had uh, two siblings with us for a year that we thought we were going to adopt. They ended up being taken and reunified with their biological mom. So uh, it's kind of uh, tough. So I can you know feel that kind of coming from that situation as well. Well, blessings on you for opening your heart so much and, and taking all that on, because I know that's not an easy journey sometimes. Yeah, it's a, it's a emotional kind of anchor, but um, all these kids are, you know, sweet kids coming from crappy situations that they just need um, a loving environment to kind of thrive and flourish. And even if they do go back, they can at least see that there's something better and something more out there. That's not how life uh, has to be. Exactly. Yeah. We call that the model of the world. They're given a different model of, of relationships and communication and it, it changes everything. You, sometimes you don't know what's possible. Like, like I tell my students and my clients, you can experience beyond your imagination, but it's really impossible to imagine beyond your experience. And, uh, you know, for them, you, you tell these kids, hey, there's this other way of being and you could talk, talk, talk. But when they actually experience it and they do something they shouldn't or they take something or they tell a story 
and, and they get love instead of instead of anger. They get love and connection instead of punishment and discipline. It just it's a world changer. Yeah, that, and I think also from like a different perspective, um, seeing somebody come from a situation like you did and uh, accomplish something that you may want to accomplish. So not the, you know, most likely or, um, you know, positive fostering situations or environment and you turn into a success in whatever you do in life. Absolutely. Whenever you see somebody that is like you succeed from the same struggles, you have a um, kind of a reposition mindset that you can do it too. Exactly. You have a hero that you can now, they've left you a ladder you can climb. If they did it, I can do it. Yep, exactly. So what uh, made you write or inspire your book? Um, well, I had been at that point, I had been teaching for about 17 years, and now I'm sitting on about 24 years, a little, little over 24. And I kept seeing the same problems in families and the same challenges and the same difficulties. And, and honestly, it's kind of frustrating because, you know, parents bring me their kids and they need more discipline, they need more confidence, they don't listen, they're shy. It's like all these different skills and, and the parents either don't have the time, they don't have the ability, or they don't know how to communicate with their kids. And so I kept seeing these same patterns over and over. And I'm like, it's, it's not complicated stuff. So I really sat down and as I worked through my own, my own recovery from the border there, from the edge, you know, what's really going on? And I look at human behavior, it falls into two camps, really two human activities. They're either games that we play to get energy, to manipulate energy, motivate energy, give energy, that's our behavior. And then the other side is the stories we tell, which is our justification, right? So I had a seven-year-old and working with her on her ability to focus and listen, things like that. And then she throws up this wall and says, well, I can't listen because I have a diagnosis. I can't sit still. I have this thing. And she threw some label at me. And it was interesting because I know her grandmother, who is a serial entrepreneur and a sheriff's deputy and has the exact same energy as her granddaughter, but rather than she grew up in a time they didn't have certain labels and certain crutches, she has a different story. So she's just a high energy person who's really interested in a lot of things. So here I've got this woman in her 50s who's high energy and interested in a lot of things. And I've got a seven-year-old who says, well, I have a diagnosis. I can't do that. And it's like, you, you ladies are going to have two different trajectories in life, two different games you're going to play, two different stories you're telling. It's, you're, you're, you're massively different. And the outcomes you're going to get are totally different. And so, you know, realizing that, that's why I put the book down is just to say, hey guys, it's not that complicated. It's some pretty simple little levers that swing some pretty big doors. So once you understand these couple of key factors, life gets a whole lot easier. So I have a section of the book that's kind of getting in the game and here's some fundamentals. And then here's how you build and define games. And then I give you 12 examples of different games you can play, like self-control, focus, respect, self-discipline, self-confidence, but also self-motivation, self-direction, you know, what is success, um, happiness, healthy, safe, wealthy wisdom. So I define those things out and then here's how you can help your kids build that. And for you, if you really don't have a definition, here's how you can get it for yourself too as a, as a grown up. And so that was the motivation. And then I put the hook on it. It was written by a, a single guy, not married, not dating and doesn't have kids. And I have a money back guarantee on it. So it's like a really strong position to say, I know this stuff works, try to prove it wrong. And I have yet to refund anybody anything because they read it and go, one, you're in my head, get out, because it's written exactly the way I talk. And then two, this stuff works. You, you do it and you get different results from your kids. Because in, in martial arts, I can't be a jerk. Because if I am, they can quit. They can just say, I don't want to pay you anymore. We're not coming. So it makes a different equation sometimes. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, um, at least for me, um, I like it's like a, a shifting of mindset. So I, I guess maybe when I was in my early 20s, and I first started working or getting into like different entrepreneurial stuff, like those excuses you would play up like, okay, I didn't come from so and so family, but this person has an advantage or, you know, I can't do this because this because I was diagnosed with this or that, like you said, but like mm -hmm. when you change that mindset and regardless of like what cards you're dealt, you can still achieve with like the right honing in on how you can do it. You can still get to where you need to get. Absolutely. You can always find, I mean, there's people that have had all kinds of challenges worse than you and they've accomplished. So if they can do it, why not you? Yeah. It's a, it's a, like a, it's a mindset change. Once you change it, like then you, you get a, a lot of perspective and then it's gaining that self-awareness first in order to be able to see your own flaws and you know say like this is what i'm doing i'm making these excuses and making a 
constant decision to change. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, one of the founders of NLP is a guy named Richard Bandler and he does some sales training stuff. And he talks a lot about the idea of just adopting beliefs. Like you don't actually have to believe this belief, but if you were to believe that this belief was true, or if, if you believe you could try this belief and you could always take it back off, you know, so what good is it to wake up in the morning and go, Oh man, I feel so rough versus you wake up and go, man, what a great day to be alive. You just choose that belief. You choose that script. That's the story. And then your behavior begins to roll from that script. So you wake up and you stretch. You go, man, what another great day to enjoy X or Y or Z or go experience this or go do this. Because what good is there to have a belief and go, man, this is hard and this sucks and I hate this and this is stupid. That's not what the elite, the, the highest performers in any activity, they share similar mindsets, similar belief system. So you don't have to believe what they believe. Just believe that you could believe what they believe. And you tell a different story and then you get different results. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's just like a thing of being grateful. So like simply waking up, having another day to do what you <laughs> want to do. Like that's super amazing when you think about it. But a lot of people lose perspective when they wake up and they're automatically negative. Oh, absolutely. I was in the hospital with a collapsed lung twice. And so, you know what? I wake up. I don't have tubes in my side. I don't have things. People didn't wake me up three times during the night to make sure I was still alive. I'm not getting, you know, pain medicine every two hours, every four hours. Yeah, I'll, I'll take whatever I got going on. My hip's a little bit tired. Oh, I, I went and ran. I'm a little sore. What a great thing. Yeah, I agree. It's all perspective and the situations you're dealt and situations you're in. Mm -hmm. So what motivates you to succeed on a personal level? Well, for a long time, it was running from, you know, all this stuff because that's like, you know, I had to succeed because I'm the only one that can provide my survival or my safety. No one else can. And, and that story has changed because now I have a family and I have a, a wife and I have a daughter and I have a stepson. We've got three cats and I've got all my students. And it's like, no, there's there's bigger things. There's there's I have to live for these eight other kids that weren't born, at least for four of them, because my brother can live for the other four. But what stories did they not tell? What things did they not experience? How can I go out and contribute more and do more? And, and the pain and things that I've been through in my life, how can I get that out to a wider audience? There's no reason another kid should have to go through the stuff that I went through simply because you know their parents don't have access to the right information or, or they don't know that, that somebody's pulled themselves out of the abyss. And it's, it really is, you know, there's, there's processes and there's things that can be done differently, stories you can tell yourself, things you can do with your parents, with your kids. And that's like, I'm actually, this week I committed to a program that's going to help me over the next 120 days to really dig into my methodology and, and blow it up to a whole nother level, um, getting into, you know, deliberately looking at the tools, tactics, the way I do the things I do to create a specific and unique brand to really take that out to a large scale mass media because just there's so much pain and confusion and there's so much that's just people stress out about or they're, they're in reaction to their own parents and they're just running from bad games to other bad games and causing more grief um, that just doesn't need to be there. So, you know, in a larger sense, there's that. And then on the personal sense, it's providing for my wife and my family and, and making sure that when I was a kid, I was, we were in the military and we traveled and saw the world. I want my kids to be able to go with me and see the world and, and go and let's go to, let's go see the reclining Buddha. I saw that when I was eight, let's go to Thailand, see the reclining Buddha. Let's do a workshop in Thailand while we're there. Let's get paid to go there and travel, but we get to meet people. We get to immerse ourselves in the culture and we get to contribute and be contributed to. If that's the experience I can give my family as they grow up, imagine how they show up in the world for other people because they've seen such a larger view. Um, and I think that you know, travel definitely changes people. So how can I make that happen? Who can I connect with? How can I serve? Those are the questions that kind of like drive me and, and make me get up and get moving in the mornings. Yeah, and I think anyone can achieve anything like when they reprogram themselves and regardless of what we spoke about earlier in terms of like any pain or negativity experienced in, in the past in anyone's life, they can either utilize it and use it as motivation and basically come to terms with it and deal with it. Obviously some instances are harder to um, deal with and cope with than others, but utilize them and, you know, harness them for something positive. Like my grandfather also passed away about three months ago that I was close with. I could have just shut down because of that, but then I know he was proud of me and like what I was doing in terms of like, you know, coming to America and 
establishing myself and being motivated and doing all these business things and becoming a foster parent. So I knew even though he was gone, you know, he's still there looking down on me and basically proud of me. So how, why would I, you know, just shut down just because of that? I had those memories with them, utilize it and harness it to keep moving forward. Absolutely. And I think that's always the best way to honor the memories of the people we love and love us is, is share the stories of who they were and be the example that they taught us of the good stuff, you know? Yeah, I agree. It's honoring kind of their, um, them and basically the legacy they left to mold us. Yep, absolutely. So what's one thing you may have struggled with in the past that you've taken and hardest into something that you utilize as a strength today? Well, when I was younger, um, I couldn't rely on anybody else to, to tell me what was true or what was real. I just didn't trust anyone. My parents gave me unconditional love and they actually didn't know about the abuse until about probably six years ago. Uh, wait, what year is it? No, eight years ago. Because it was 2011 when I told them. So it made me very intellectually driven and I had a huge not, huge desire to understand. I mean, at 12, I was doing cross-cultural religious studies. I'd read the Rig Vita, the Upanishads, and, and I'd also read the Torah. I had read uh, the... Uh, the Quran, the Bible several times. I was just voraciously looking at, you know, why are things are the way they are? Why do we do the things that we do? And the beautiful thing that that's done for me now is I have a very broad cultural reference going back decades and decades plus um, going forward. So I've got a lot of different ways I can relate to a lot of different people, a lot of different situations. And that's very powerful when I'm teaching because I can give my students, whether they're a you know, four or five-year-old kid or a 45-year-old dad or a, an 87-year-old grandmother, I can give them references and I can give them stories and models from literally any, any place, any time in the world. And that serves them to just open them to seeing more potential as well. And so that intellectual fear, you know, that need to dominate because I was afraid when I was a kid, now I've learned, you know, get consent before you coach. Don't just spew stuff all over people all the time. You got to ask, hey, could I offer you a thought on that? Would it be okay if I shared something with you? You know, so, so that was a huge shift and I still see it very helpful now. And for my students, it makes it cool to kind of be a nerd and like know stuff that other people don't know because it's like, well, well, Sifu knows this thing. I didn't know that. That's so cool. And so that helps to kind of drive things as well. No, yeah, I think uh, that's really important. And the, the fact that you got that kind of worldview early that you can utilize now and have all this perspective, because a lot of people in all walks of life think they need to learn what they need to learn, and then they don't have to attain any kind of knowledge moving forward. But like the fun of it is actually, you know, keep growing and in terms of kind of re reinventing yourself and gaining more perspective from the world around you. Oh, absolutely. As a kid, I was always like, I want to know everything. So what's one piece of advice, either personal or professional, you can leave with the audience? Um, get rid of expectations and start living in appreciation. Yeah, that's that's pretty much to the point. You want to elaborate a little bit or if you want to leave <laughs> yeah. it at that kind of yeah. core? No, no, absolutely. <laughs> so so like with my wife, right? If, if she and I fall into expectations, well, she expects me to do the dishes or I expect her to clean this or whatever. Whenever we start living in expectations, we start creating our rules for other people's behavior. And then they don't live up to our rules for their behavior. Then we get mad at them. And it's like, dude, you did that to yourself. You're you created the expectation when you guys first got in a relationship they did this part and you appreciated it and you did that part and they appreciated it and then over time you start to have these expectations these standards right same thing with employees if we give a christmas bonus or a holiday bonus every year then it, it's no longer like a, a bonus it's just expected i should get it and then when they don't there's hell to pay so you know it, it's recognizing how do we stay in that place of appreciation and go man this is really cool i really appreciate this that and the other people will do more for appreciation than they will for money a lot of times and and so recognizing the effort that people are putting in plus it takes in our brain chemistry it takes three positives to override the impact of one negative chemically so if we know and understand that we should be praising our kids for their effort and reminding them of all the things they did right every single day and yeah, there's a couple of areas we need to grow. We all have that. But look at all these things you did right. I'm proud of you. You're amazing. And if that's how we raise our kids, 
what kind of generation are we producing? We're not blowing smoke. We're not, um, you know, fluffing them and just saying whatever to give them the tri the trophy. But it's genuinely these things you did well, and here's some areas to grow. I think you're amazing. I think you're wonderful, and I know you're going to get this. And we give them, help them, model that confidence. Then they can take the hit and keep moving because they see, yeah, I messed this up, and I've got all these other strengths. So if I could just get everyone I know to shift out of expectations and move into appreciation, I think life would just get better for everyone and be a whole lot more fun. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's being in kind of a constant state of gratitude and not expectation. So just be thankful for a situation because like you said, like a relationship may change. It grows and kind of changes and redefines itself over time based on the two people and how they're changing as well as kind of the work situation like if you're expecting and only working for a bonus you're not going to be as driven as just you know working for the passion of it or simply doing good work exactly my uh my we were on a hike this past weekend and my stepson was here and we were talking with him about you know hey you're looking out for your sister you're being helpful because he tried to carry her across some rocks and he misstepped and got his feet soaked and he was angry for a moment or two and he's like ah oh, i just want to go home and we're like really and he's like no i'm gonna stay but so we were like, hey, you know, you're scoring big brother points. And so then he was like going into the economy of big brother points. And well, if I do this, how many points would I get if I do that? And we're like, dude, the whole point of brother points is not a unit of exchange. It's a recognition you're doing awesome because that's who you are. So we're not ready for the intrinsic, extrinsic identity and reward mechanism conversation. He's nine. But it's the idea that you being your best and doing your best is because of who you are and how you show up is who you are. And you're awesome. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't always get that reinforcement in other situations that he lives in. So we did a, a for 4th of July, he did a um, lemonade stand with his cousins at the 4th of July parade. And when it ended, he was out in the street yelling, drum, drumming up business. He probably made, they're selling it for a quarter. And he probably made 30 bucks in 40 minutes as, as things were ending. And he was up there by himself. So he's like, why should you get a larger portion? Because I earn more. And it's like, well, you didn't negotiate terms ahead of time. It's a four-way split, blah, blah, blah. So he's upset. And we're like, dude, this is who you are. You're amazing. You're a beast. You, you showed up so strongly and so powerfully. And so reinforcing that identity and helping him to see and be grateful to himself for who he is and the standard he holds himself to versus, but I didn't get paid X number of dollars. It's like, don't worry about that. That'll take care of itself. You keep being you and keep being awesome. The universe will catch up. Yeah, I, I agree. It's kind of doing the right things when no one is watching. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you stopping by today. Can you let the audience know how they can find you or anything else you may have going on? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to give them a free copy of my book. All they need to do is uh, pay shipping and handling, and we'll get it to them wherever they are. And it is at freebook dot theparentingprogram.com and then if they want to connect with me I'm on Facebook mostly and it would be Jeremy R. Dot, the Kung Fu Guy and those are the two best places to get a hold of me and um, yeah this has been a great conversation and I hope that your audience finds value in it and they can take some action out of this for themselves and their relationships with their kids and their family. Awesome thanks again for stopping by. Yeah thank you you've been great. This podcast has been brought to you by Nova Zora Digital. Find out how Nova Zora Digital can help your company grow online. Learn more at NovaZoraDigital.com. Until next time, all you digital savages.